student of leadership and organizational design, former nuclear submarine commander and named one of the top 100 leadership speakers by Inc. Magazine, David is the author of the Amazon number one bestseller, Turn the Ship Around and the Turn the Ship Around workbook. David's latest book, Leadership is Language, is a Wall Street Journal bestseller. And David imagines a workplace where everyone engages and contributes their full intellectual capacity. A place where people are healthier and happier because they have more control over their work. A place where everyone is a leader. Hello and welcome to Talk Business with David. Hey David, thanks for having me on your show. Oh, thank you so much for joining us, David. Really excited to do this with you today. When anyone thinks of leadership experts, your name will always be one of the first to spring to mind. So tell us, <laughs> how, how did that become so? What is your leadership story that has led you to this point? It's an un, in, in 1,000 parallel universes, this would have only happened once. So it's a very unlikely story. So I was, the, I was a precocious, geeky, introverted, math geek, uh, chess club geek in high school. It was a Cold War, so I wanted to do something about it. I felt passionately about uh, liberal democracy as opposed to what Soviet Union was uh, seemed to stand for. And if you're an introvert, submarines, man, because submarines hide from people. Yes. So, and, and the submariners are kind of like the chess players of the Navy, like the fighter pilots. They get all the glory, but it's hot and um, racy. Uh, our, our world is slower, but sort of, it's all in your head because you can't see anything. Anyway, it appealed to me and I was, I was successful. I, um, on the strength of being able to tell people what to do. Yeah. Yeah. My success was firmly rooted in me in, in a model of leadership where I was a decision maker. I was a smart one in the room. I was allocated the thinking part of the job. And the team was the doing part of the job. And their job, my job, is to get them to do what I decided they needed to do. I, I get selected to be a submarine commander. I, I go to school for 12 months for one submarine. And at the very last minute, two weeks to go, they say, no, 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 you're going to go to a different submarine, one of the newest submarines in the fleet, the USS Santa Fe. By the way, worst morale in the fleet and the worst performance in the fleet. Yeah. And... My, my realization, because a submarine I'd never been on, yeah. right. kind of submarine, yeah. all the buttons were different. The theory was the same, but the execution. And I call, I call my leadership model, the model I grew up with, knowing, telling leadership. It's a model where you want to know the answer. And because you know the answer, you earn the right to tell people what to do. On the Santa Fe, I didn't know the answer. I wanted to be that kind of leader, but I couldn't because I was making bad decisions. I was putting people's lives at risk. So I said, you know what? The problem here is not my bad decision making. The problem here is I am the decision maker. We need a team where the decisions are made by people other than me, by you, you lot, you, the officers, yeah. the chiefs, even the enlisted men, all the way down, even them. <laughs> and that was, a, that, was, that was a huge mindset shift for me. I, I viewed myself as the factory, the, as the manager, the architect, a better word, the architect of a decision-making factory. And that if I could orchestrate the process whereby the team came up with decisions so that consistently quality decisions came out of the decision-making factory. That's what I needed to do and our lives depended on it. Yeah. I only had one tool available to me, yeah. which was the words that we spoke. And I only had one person whose behavior I could control, and that was myself. Yeah. Fortunately, all those things are very powerful and they're aligning when you realize them. And it's this rejection of these natural laws. Oh, no, I can control other people. Oh, other people are going to try and control me. Like, that doesn't work. And so when you realize the only person you can control is yourself and the most powerful thing you have are the words that you say. In other words, don't give your team, a, and by this, I don't mean, oh, give them a lecture. Oh, you guys speak up. You guys be proactive. Oh, you guys take initiative. Oh, you guys, you guys, you guys are all screwed up. It so pissed me off when I heard those kind of lectures. I said, well, how about you do something? How about, you know, pointing back to the leader? Now I was that person. Yeah. 
And one of my guys pointed back to me and said, well, like, what about you? What's your, re-? and I said, you know what? I think my, my problem is I'm, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm addicted to telling people what to do. So I'm going to stop telling you guys what to do. Yeah. Never going to give another order as a submarine commander. This was, I was two weeks, <laughs> yeah, two weeks into it. I had three years to go, but uh, it turns out that this is the most powerful structure yeah. because it evokes thinking. And it's an invitation to thinking and, and, and an invitation to be visible and an invitation for the team to have agency. And it's an invitation to get everyone's brain on board, not just a few people at the top and on and on and on. And so morale up and we set records and then performance went up and we set records. And I'm now this annoying zealot who's very convinced that the way we teach people how to be leaders, the images that we get from the movies and the popular press is, is, is it's not really wrong. It's just very limiting. Yeah. And, and, and it limits the thinking to just people at the top of the group. And there's this implicit bargain that I'll do the thinking, you'll do the doing. Yeah. And that I, I think this is not the best way for humans to operate. Yeah. To be fair, David, there are probably quite a few more boring leadership backstories than the one that you've just given. They, they probably... <laughs> what is the general temperature of employee engagement and worker satisfaction today? Yeah, I mean, it fluctuates, but generally it's it's not that good. I, I think the last thing I read is during COVID, I think it actually went up. I'm a little bit annoyed by the quote engagement. Um, gurus because they're going to, they try and sell this big long list of, well, if you want people to be engaged, do A, B, C, D, double Z. And then like, I think it's very simple. If you want people to be engaged, give them decision-making authority. Yeah. That's step one. Step two is repeat step one. There's no other steps. Now, how you do that, that's where the magic lies. But if you don't do that, there's no amount of giving people feedback and a feedback sandwich or whatever else nonsense you can dream up. None of that's going to help if they don't have the ability to make decisions. Yeah. If they do have the ability to make decisions, they'll be engaged. Yeah. I had a friend contact me when they found out that I was going to be interviewing you today, David, a big fan. And they said that they was really interested because that they have really bought into your model and, you know, empowering people to be the best that they can be, to be decision makers. They wanted to ask what and how do you manage a situation if you inherit a team or you go into a new business for the first time and actually the team that you're going to be manager are actually not competent. They haven't got the skill set and they haven't got the attitude to be the best that they can be either. What do you do in a situation like that? Well, first thing you do is celebrate because that's the best you're going to be able to create a huge amount of value. So hopefully you know, you bought the company for 10 cents on the dollar and it's going to be worth $2 on the dollar in two years or, or, or whatever. Um, I would always joke on the submarine, things were so bad. I would always joke anything over zero, anything divided by zero, because we would always like compare anything divided by zero is going to be a big number. Yeah. <laughs> so step one, celebrate. Step two. Um, you need visibility on people's competence. And many organizations are reluctant to ask this question, to test that. Technical competence is a measurable skill. It's a test I can give you. You can get a good score or a bad score in whatever domain that you're in. Most organizations are so afraid of actually giving people a test that they won't. They're afraid from a couple of dimensions. Number one, it'll feel like invasive, like who am I to question your technical competence? And number two is, I'm afraid that it's gonna come out to be a really dismally low yeah. number. Uh, most organizations that I, I think they, it, it's way more organizations have less technical competence than they think they actually do. However, that shouldn't hold you back from giving people the authority to make decisions. And our special word was intent. So people would come and say, here's what I intend to do. 
And then we'd have, now it gets interesting. And when we have an interesting conversation, we say, okay, well, tell me about that. Well, even if I agreed or disagreed, you have to ask the same set of questions. Otherwise, they'll get a sense of, oh, these are the questions he asked when he thinks it's a bad idea. And these are the questions they ask when he thinks it's a good idea. So you have to ask the same questions. Like, tell me more. Like, how does that align with our objectives? How does that fulfill the mission? Blah, blah, blah. And then they would kind of get smart and they would just like preemptively, hey, Captain, here's what I intend to do. Here's the outlines of the objectives. Here's how it fulfills our mission. Blah, blah, blah. Now, the magic happens when you can decouple that conversation from trust. In other words, if you, you can be asked hard questions, we don't like that question why in this case, it tends to be provocative and put people on defensive. Well, why would you wanna do that? But even if, if you were to ask that, hey, David, why are you doing that? Like, why are you doing that? You say, well, look, let me show you. Let me expose my thinking in an unprotective way, undefensive way. You help make it better. Why? Because it's, I, the reason I, can, I feel safe to do that is because I know there's a deep trust below it where you believe whatever it is I'm telling you is for the best of the organization. I don't have some secret agenda where David Knight's going to get rich off this program, the organization's going to be screwed, or anything like that. And if we have that deep abiding trust, then we can have an argument about, well, this is a wrong guess, and you should have these guests. No, no, it shouldn't be. 30 minute program, it should be an hour, it should be a five hour, like what? And so now we can have all these conversations unhindered by the baggage of, well, uh, don't you trust me? So that, that's one of the things. That, and over to you. <laughs> Stalled out. <laughs> it brings me on to a LinkedIn post that you posted the other day that I just thought was outstanding. Um, when you said about having that open dialogue and you said that one of the biggest mistakes that leaders make when they're having a team meeting is to speak first and set the agenda and i'll be honest with you i nearly fell off my chair when i read that because a i'd never thought of that before and b i am so guilty of doing that tell us a little bit more about that david yeah look so the team so i'm talking about decision meetings here we got to decide hey how we change the marketing plan how we change are we going to hire this person are we going to release the product are we going to add two more features before we release like the okay the, all these decisions that we make all the time and the traditional way a decision meeting is run is discuss and then vote. Yeah. Hey, let's talk about it, blah, blah, blah. And then we'll vote, it tends to be a binary vote. Should we launch the product or not? Up, down. What's happening is everyone is reading the room and they're just gonna, and they're gonna vote the way they think the room, yeah. whatever the temperature in the room is and or whatever the leader thinks or some, weighted combination of it. So, oh yeah, this is the CEO's pet project, blah, blah, blah. It's, and so if you're the leader and you already say, hey, so I think this is a really good idea. We've done all the testing, 737 Max is a really important product because Airbus is getting ahead of us. They got a reputation for being technologically ahead. And we got to sort of catch up, blah, 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 blah. We've done this testing and the FAA is on the board. So let's vote. Should we launch 737 Max? Only someone who really is looking for a new job is going to vote no. Right. People are not stupid. Yeah. So what happens is what you've done is called anchoring. The psychological mechanism is called anchoring. What we've done is we narrowed the cognitive diversity in the group. Well, I'll say a better. What we've narrowed is the expression of cognitive diversity because the people who think differently from the group now are gonna be more reluctant to speak up. So if you as a leader, you will hear some different, you'll hear a conversation. It's like, okay, how many, um, what should we price the product at? $125. Someone will argue, oh no, really 105. No, no, maybe 135. No one's gonna argue at this point, $300 or free. Like those, you've lost that. So what you want to do is say, everyone take out a card, write down on, on a card before, and we're not going to talk about it. Write down what you think we should price this product at. Now everyone flip your cards over. Now you look to the highest and the lowest and ask those people to tell yeah. what went behind that. Yeah. Because you want to capture the moment of maximum cognitive diversity. Otherwise it's lost forever. The way we normally run meetings, it's actually deliberately 
about building consensus, which acts is obviously the opposite of diversity. So you don't want to build consensus. You want to embrace variability in a decision-making meeting. Meetings of cognitive diversity will result in better decisions over the long run, and you'll be in business a thousand years from now. Yeah. But if you're just banking, putting on your eggs and the fact that you're right all the time, eventually you're going to be wrong. Yeah. And you go, make money, make money, make money, bankrupt. Yeah. Yeah. So good. What must leaders overcome mentally and emotionally to give up control yet retain full responsibility? <laughs> That's good. I, um, the problem first, the problem is always you. It's never anybody else. The problem is always me. Uh, the problem, the problem isn't there. The problem is they're not speaking up. The problem is you're not creating an environment where it's easy for them to speak up. Yeah. Here's, here's what you can do. What, what's lock, what's going on with lockdown now in, in the UK? We're about a week away from not being in one anymore, thankfully. Oh, that's good. Okay, so you go out to a restaurant. You look at the server. The server comes by. They got the menu. Server says, blah, blah, blah. And you say, oh, like, I have fish and chips. Or, like, what's look good? And they'll say, oh, chicken's looking good. Okay, I have chicken. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, what I want you to do is try and do something different. Change the script. What I want you to do... See if you can get the server to make the decision for you. So you say, hey, you know what? I'm not going to give you the whole secret here, but the, the, bot, the end of the conversation needs to be, I need you to, like, I need you to choose for me. Yeah. And you just choose for me. Whatever you choose, it'll be fine. Put it in front of me. And then I'll know what you chose for me when you put it in front of me. Now, the reason this is a perfect exercise is because leadership happens through practice. It happens like uh, when, we, when we work with a company, we'll say, they'll say, well, let's build a leadership development program. And I'll say, okay, great. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a little activity. I'm only going to give you 10 minutes. I want to do, I want, I want to train everybody on how to play football or something. Swim, yeah. do open water swimming, whatever. Or maybe learn a new language. I want you to be able to run a meeting in Spanish or English one year from now. What would you do? Those are the two good metaphors, either sports or language. And they write up this program. And they say, okay, now replace the word language with leadership. That's what your program should look like. Now, when people say we want to learn a new language, they don't say we're going to do a two-day offsite and then we'll call it good. <laughs> that's not how we learn a language. And that's not how we learn leadership. So we learn leadership by practice. We kick the ball, we say the words, and we see what happens. So that's what this is. This is practice in a place that doesn't really matter. So like, you like it, you don't like it. If you're allergic to peanuts, you might want to tell them. Yeah. yeah. So it's, but here's the thing. You have to live with the anxiety of not knowing what you're going to get. And you have to make it safe for them to make the choice for you. So try it when you're tired. Try it when you're not tired. Try it when you're at your regular restaurant. Try it when you're in a new restaurant. Try it when you just landed on an airplane that took you from London to Seoul. Try, you know, try, like, well, why is that harder? Know that about yourself. What it now, and, and, and what about the server? How come sometimes they react one way? How come sometimes they react a different way? How come sometimes you didn't, you're surprised by their reaction? What did you not notice about the way they were standing in front of you? Yeah. How did you create a connection so that they feel they know you well enough or know well enough what you want. Uh, we call this also, we call it pushing the authority for the decision to the person with the information. Yeah, yeah. You know what you want. We call that clarity of purpose. Like, so you may have the purpose. For me, it tends to be things like, hey, I'll take 800 calories. I don't eat meat. Other than that, pretty good. They know what's coming out of the kitchen. So they have the information. As an alternative, you can say, uh, let the chef pick or something, something like that. that. That tends to let them off the hook a little bit, but it's all about safety. The second part, the thing I'm talking about now is about safety. So it's you living with anxiety it's, and then creating safety for them. This yeah. is exactly the skill you need. This is exactly how I felt. Every day as a submarine commander, it was as if I said, hey, you, you decide. Now, in this case, you don't, you don't know where you're going to get until you get it. 
the way we operate the submarine was I would say, tell me what you intend to do. Tell me what you intend to bring me. But for this particular exercise, because the consequences are so low, we try and stretch it actually to call it level six, just do it. Yeah. How important is the language that we use in leadership? There's nothing more important. It's everything. It's how we communicate. It's how we talk about a vision. It's how we convey what we're trying to do. It's how we, how we invite people to uh, tell us what they think, even if what they think might be bad news. And people, people say, well, why do I focus on the words? Isn't like how they're delivered, does that matter? And I've, I've heard that body language is 70% more, that's 70% of the signals in body language. No, the study was if the words and the body language differ, then go with the body language. But the bulk of the meaning as long as the words and the body language are consistent, the meaning is conveyed in words. Yeah. yeah. So, and here's the cool thing. You control your words. Most people actually don't control their words. They just say what comes into their head and what comes in their head has been seeded there by what they've seen, which is what their parents saw, which is what their grandparents saw, which your great grandparents saw, which was a cotton mill in Manchester. And so you're running your life as if you were running a cotton mill in Manchester from the 1850s, because we haven't, ever, we haven't deliberately changed our language. And so we have all hands meetings, or we will, uh, the way I, I talked about running meetings, the fact that we have leaders and followers, the fact that we have white collar, blue collar, the fact that we have management, union, all these things are vestiges of the industrial revolution where we separated people and humans into thinkers and doers now they all look human so I, like i might get confused so i'll help you with that we're going to put on different uniforms yeah. we're going to wear a coat and tie you're going to wear overalls oh that makes it easy in, in the airplane different uniforms in the hospital different uniforms on a construction site different uniforms why because then we're signaling we're the decision makers and you guys are the doers yeah anyway it's a bad dichotomy how do leaders ensure that they are kept in a loop without beginning to micromanage? Eyes on, hands off. Just because you know doesn't mean you have to interject. Uh, so think that there's a, this works both sides. As a leader, in order to build trust comes from transparency exercise over time. It's, you don't have to be right all the time, but you do have to be transparent. So it goes both ways. So from the subordinates position, you wanna say, hey, let me expose my thinking. Here, I got a decision. Here's how I'm thinking about it. Can you help me make my thinking stronger? Now, if you go over to your boss and you say, I got this decision, whether we should do use Times New Roman or Ariel on this presentation, your boss is gonna tell you the answer. And then you're gonna whine about being micromanaged. But if you go to your boss and say, hey, I gotta make a decision about what font to use. Here are the things I'm thinking about. Like our brand is about simplicity and human, but at the same time, I want readability. And so I'm gonna weigh these criteria. I'm gonna use these criteria to make my decision. How can I make, like, what am I missing? What is there a criteria that I'm not thinking about that's important, that kind of thing. So now you're inviting your boss to improve the thinking process, not make a decision for you. And the same thing happens on the boss's side. If, if your team is being transparent with you, they're not necessarily asking you to solve their problem. In fact, even if they are, I would not solve the problem. We call it, we turn the problem unsolved. So they go, hey, what about blah, 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 here's the situation? What should I do? I would go, hmm, well, what, like, what do you think in terms of an assessment? Like, how do we get here? What's the root cause? I'm not asking them, I'm not saying, no, 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 this is your decision. That's a big jump. That's, that creates a lack of safety. Yeah. So, you just, so it's always description, assessment, then action for the future. It's like a VCR. Pause, just where are we right now? Describe the world. Assessment, rewind, how do we get here? Then 
fast forward, pause, rewind, fast forward, say, okay, well, I think the pump's having a problem. I think it's, I, the description is vibrating. Assessment, bearings are going bad. Action, replace the bearings. And that can be, I'd like permission to, which is the traditional way of asking that question, yeah. or I intend to. I'm gonna coordinate with these three other people and next week at noon, I'm gonna shut down the pump. We're gonna have the other pump running and intend to replace the bearings then. Or I just did it. Yeah, I was about to blow itself apart, so we had to shut it down. Yeah. So that's the process. Description, assessment, action. Yeah. Yeah. Having written um, such a heavyweight uh, bestseller in the world of self-development, I'm interested. What books or resources have been most useful to you in helping you develop yourself over the years? Yeah, um, there's so many good books. Um, I uh, so I'll give the readers some uh, some of the listeners some ones that they may not have heard before. Number one is there's a book called How to Talk So Kids Will Listen, How to Listen So Kids Will Talk. I found this to be a life changing book, both for how I interacted with my kids and how I interacted as a leader. And I kept this in my safe. My top secret safe with the nuclear co launch codes when I was a captain because I didn't want the team to think I thought about them as kids. But the genius of this book is it gives it gives words like so. Like the first part of the book talks about accepting people's feelings, but it goes much further than that. It says, well, like what kind of words do we use when we're not accepting feelings, and what kind of words do we use? So, so now it's not like preaching accepting feelings. Oh yeah, I got that. It's like, well, what words come out of your mouth so that you actually are accepting someone's feelings? And I'll give you a hint. I hear you is not one of them. Yeah. That's number one. Number two, I mean, I think uh, there's a lot of wisdom in the classics. Um, Jane Austen is one of my go-tos. Um, Pride and Prejudice is obviously about Pride and Prejudice and how that derails you. It's really about ego yeah. and ego getting in your way. Um, it's kind of hard to go wrong with the classics. I was reading the Iliad recently and rereading and um, there's a scene in the Iliad. So the Iliad's the story of the Greeks are going to Troy um, to make battle against the, the city's Ilium. So make battle against, hence the Iliad. Uh, anyway, there, there, there's a common Greek soldier. I call this the first dissenting opinion. So there's a common Greek soldier who speaks up to the king saying, at some point, they've been there for nine years. And the soldier says, hey, ha haven't you got enough spoils and riches? Isn't it, can we just go home to our families? What do they do? They beat him. So, so this idea that like go along, it, it goes all the way back to the oldest um, texts in Western civilization because there are severe repercussions for telling, giving a dissenting opinion, giving a different, just a different perspective. He's also, it's very interesting, um, uh, He's described as like pointy headed with a small tuft of hair and slow, stooped shoulders. Like he's, he's described as in a, with very demeaning and dismissive physical characteristics. And then Odysseus beats him with a stick yeah. for the impudence of talking back to the king. Anyway, I just think it's really interesting how these, a lot of these dysfunctional behaviors become back so far yeah we can come out naturally yeah yeah david time has absolutely flown by yeah do you have any closing thoughts and also how can people follow you on your journey yeah so um thanks for mentioning the books turn the ship around it's probably where i'd start leadership is language the workbook turn the ship around workbook is is um you can get for nine or ten bucks what we charge corporations big bucks to go tell them the workbook is how we how we implement run workshop but i think probably the most fun thing to do go to youtube type in leadership nudges n-u-d-g-e-s leadership nudges and that's my channel and each week i put out a little blurb 
uh, talking about one little tiny thing, like we, like within the conversation, like go to dinner, don't order. Yeah, that's a leadership nudge, and we have. I've uh, been doing it for like uh, six years now. So there's over 300. Yeah, it's awesome. Of them. So uh, that's real fun. Try them. Um, uh, let, let me know in the comments. You can subscribe and it's an email straight from me. So you hit reply, it comes back to me. Yeah. Say hi on LinkedIn. That'd be great. And uh, Twitter, it's at L David Marquet. L for Lewis. Well, well, what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that we've got links to your books, your social media, and your YouTube channel in the description below. David, thanks again for your time. I really enjoyed it. 